Yeah, we got a mission to go further east into um, toward to crit. So, okay. uh, we, uh, we mounted up and did a, like a two day movement east and, uh, crossed Haditha dam. I think it's kind of like, I listened to Brandy's and he, I think he kind of talked about it a little bit. I think, uh, yep. the, their main fighting had happened already. So it was, it was relatively secure, you know? So we just kind of beat feet across it and stopped yeah, yeah. long enough to hop out and go take a, take a photo at Haditha dam, you know, like, like it's Hoover <laughs> dam or something right. like that. Yeah, yeah. Pop back in and and keep on rolling, and uh, that's when we went out to, I forget the objective's name. We linked up with um, with one seven five out there. There was another staging base that had had been secured, and we linked up with them and started doing some operations with with those guys. Okay. Um. So that's that kind of like our fateful night that that next night. So we do we do the ranger thing, you know. We do like a quick hasty rock drill. It's not just the Rangers, it's the Rangers, it's the Army SMUs out there. There's there's little birds, there's there's lots of stuff out there. You know, this is gonna be a, a, a relatively large objectives. And uh the Army uh the SMU recce element, they they were gonna take one uh battle position watching the approach of this. I think it was objective camel, I think is what it's called, but it was another it, it was it was K2 airfield, which became FOB Spiker. For dudes who okay. who deployed to Iraq later on in the war, and it's right uh, on the edge of Tikrit. So uh, they okay. were going to watch the approach to the airfield from the north, and and my team got uh, the approach uh, from the south because there were some main roads leading into it, and uh, and one seven five was going to go in. I think they're going at half half gaff and half half, you know, like helicopter okay. and half ground. So and you were there so to kind of make sure that nobody was going to in interdict them before they yep, were yep. we were just kind of watching the avenues of approach from the south and and everything you know and you know this is still early enough on really like, yeah at, at night there's triple you see triple a going up all, all around you know, off in the distance you know but it's wow. far enough away where it's usually you know you're like well it's not affecting any of my dudes and it's probably s60 and most of our aircraft can can deal with that stuff stuff sure. pretty easily anyway so so we're on the on the south side you know, just in, a, in our, uh, our, our battle position, you know, two Humvees kind of parked, just kind of scanning stuff. Um, I'm in the uh, team leader's vehicle, but I'm in the driver's side, rear seat, rear seat, driver's side. And so you got a driver, team leader in the front, you got a person in the turret and myself in the back seat. And, you okay. know, there's no doors on it. So you're just kind of sitting in there and I'm uh, yeah following, you know, Falcon view where we're at. I'm monitoring sat and I'm monitoring strike because the assault is going down in the airfield and one seven five has priority fires. You know, I'm just kind of monitoring, you know, all this sort of stuff, you know, like I don't want a, yeah, a strike yeah. Eagle to go, Hey, I've got two vehicles South of the airfield. Should we take them out? And it's <laughs> right. like, no, we're friendlies. Um, <laughs> so we're just kind of mon- monitoring things, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. pretty quiet. The most, uneventful anything we had done in the past three weeks you know just just whatever we're just kind of there you know and then we see um we see some some triple a go up but it's relatively close i'm like you know it's like seemed like it was only several hundred meters so we're like hey let's go investigate so we move forward about 300 meters and uh all of a sudden the other vehicle that had two army dudes had uh scott sailor the controller and uh-huh. uh josh the pj uh we're, we're i mean we're side by side parked you know like two cops would like on an interstate talking to each other and their vehicle just explodes into like a ball of fire like just you know like destroyed you know like parts flying everywhere so instantly Jeez. the driver of i vehicle hits the gas you know hey uh let's get out of the kill zone the uh the gunner starts swinging around the 50 cal and starts letting loose and i just get on the radio i'm trying to call the strike eagles and next thing i know i see a bright flash of light and i wake up i don't know how much longer like laying on the ground about 10 feet from my vehicle and it's destroyed oh my God. Uh, so i'm you know so now it's like it's sort of quiet except for a snapping of of small arms coming coming overhead kind of kind of laying there and I'm like, it's just kind of out of a movie, you know, you got 
there's fire and there's smoke, but it's relatively quiet. There's no engines running anymore. Just snapping yeah. of, of, of rounds. And I'm laying there and I'm like, I don't have a weapon on me anymore. I don't have my rucks and my, my pack that has all my stuff in it. All I've got is my, my, I had, I had like a plate carrier on, I had a, a rack on. That was the okay. only thing that was left, left on me. And, uh, I don't know how long I was out. You know, it was only a couple minutes probably yeah. kind of come to, and then I, you know, you, you know, you can't really hear very well, you know, and you're like, you see some, some people staggering around, you know, and you're like, you know, get up and, and find out that, you know, every one of my vehicles like laying down moaning, you know, or, or out as well. And we're still taking yeah, fire. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I jump up. And uh, Kurt, who was a driver, he ended up losing like an eye. So he was pretty messed up on scene. So we kind of grab him, pull him off the side. There happened to be like a three foot uh, dirt berm right there. Okay. Uh, so we kind of kind of pull him to the other side. Uh, Swedes up in the in the front passenger seat, and we get and Chris is up in the turret. So you know between Swede and I, and Chris is kind of messed up in the legs as well. We kind of get him. You know, Chris, he went to MFF jam with us later yeah, yeah. on. So we yeah. get him, get it, get us kind of all, you know, settled on the other side of the berm, you know, and we're like trying to take assessment of what's going on. And like, no one has a weapon. I mean, basically got blown out of it. I have a, I have a, I have my bread and my nine mil, which is on my rack and I've got an oh. bitter, and that's about all I have left. Now, I've got yeah, magazines. Yeah. I just don't have a, I don't have an M4 to put them in. And neither does anyone else. You sure. Know? God, who well, knows where I, they are at this point? I mean, gee, what? Well, exactly. I mean, shit's burning. Stuff starting to cook off. And we're like, well, we're in a world hurt. And this is not going to be uh, very good. And uh, yeah. you know, so we see off in the distance. We, we'll probably get like a couple hundred meters from that other vehicle. And, you know, it's like fully engulfed in flames. You know, it's just a ball of fire. And all of a sudden, you know. Matt comes up to our location. He was the driver of the other vehicle. And he's like, I, I don't think anyone made it. It was bad. You know, and he's oh like, God. he's out of it too, right? And yeah. uh, so we pull him in and we can't talk to anyone. You know, I'm the only one that had comms. So I had an embitter on me. Um, right. But no one's answering the inner team. And we're still taking fire. So we're like, um, all right, so what do we do now? And, uh, you know, so we're like, we need to get to a, a hardened defensible position. So, you know, uh, we, we can see off the distance, there's like a train, there's a train track with a, with a little bridge and a culvert under it. So we're like, okay. let's move to there. Let's hard point. Let's get some defense going. And, uh, you know, like what I told you is about all I remember of that situation. Other than I remember like having one, well, we're actually, let me back up real fast. So we're, we're, we're on the other side of the berm and we're like, we don't, I don't have a map. I don't know how to like, you know, I'm trying to call the strike Eagle. No one's answering. And, yeah. uh, and I'm like, I, where, where, the, where are we? Cause I don't have a map because right. it was on the computer that is now destroyed. Sure. But back then it was so janky that we had to take our E-Trexes and we zip tied them to the top of the home V. And that was our GPS antenna for the CF-18. So I'm oh, like, okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to grab this. Shit. So I go up there and stuff's cooking off. And I, I cut this off the scene, the roof real fast. I jump back over the berm. And now I'm, now we have, have a location where we're at. So I'm nice. like on the radio, I get a hold of the strike Eagles and let them know that, Hey, we're, we're American team. We need, we need a QRF. You know, at some point we're trying to assess our situation. And, yeah. uh, we, we were able to talk them on to our burning vehicles. And, uh, after that, all I remember is kind of going, well, we're probably not making it out of this one. And I remember walking South and then, and then I remember laying in the culvert, trying to stay awake to talk to the aircraft enough to go, Hey, I need you to pass off to striker, you know, seven, one or whoever was over at the other, you know, whatever seven series it was, uh, yeah. pass them my call sign. This is my location. We have eight, eight wounded at least, and at least, we, yeah. we need help, you know. But we never get any confirmation back that that QRF is coming for us. 
we just, oh, he's no. like, yep, word's been passed. And, uh, you know, we're like, you know, we don't know where the rest of our team is. I don't, we don't, I don't know if they're alive, if they're dead, you know, we're not, we're not going to put any, any ordinance down. So, so we do a couple show of force passes and, uh, yeah, yeah. and fire kind of stops at that point. And I remember uh-huh. at this point, I, I don't even think I'm wounded at this point. I think, you know, I'm just uh-huh. like, you know, I got knocked out. Just days or something. Was, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the culvert and Matt, Matt is kind of like, kind of doing medic stuff with us because the you know, PJ's at the other location at, you know, at this point I, I'm thinking they didn't make it. So Matt has a medic bag and he's like, I, I remember him looking at my back and he gets you know red light. on. he goes, Oh, sh- you. I'm like, what? And he goes, uh, I, I need to, you need to, we need to take care of this right now. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, you're oh, coming man. back. And I'm like, Oh, uh, so he bandages it. He bandages it up. And at this point I'm, I'm like lightheaded. I can barely, like I, I keep going American fighters. I can't even remember call signs at this point. You know, I'm just trying yeah. to, I'm just trying to stay awake. You're, and then I the, can't imagine, I can't believe you're even doing what you're doing. I mean, after that, I mean, gee whiz. Well, it's amazing. Know, it's survival, right? You know I mean? Like for sure, you, for sure. You know, you, you know, I mean the training kind of kicks in and I'm, I'm kind of doing a piss poor job at it, but Perfect. enough to probably like pass minimum essential information to coordinate a, a link up and a QRF and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's yeah. It's yeah, amazing. So, but you know, like, and some of that, what I've told you is, is all of us that were there together kind of recreating it in our minds by talking about it. I don't know if all those are conscious memories, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. like there's a bunch of like, you know, this whole event takes like 12 hours from when, when we get hit to when, QRFs at our location picking us up and I've got like three memories of it. You know, I remember waking up. I remember grabbing the GPS. I remember going, Oh, shit, we're not going to make it. I remember sitting in the culvert, Matt going, Oh, fa- Oh heck. And American fighters. That's about what I remember. And, um, so was, was your back like, like t- tell me about your injuries. Like what, like what, how, what kind of injuries did you sustain? Yes. Yeah, so, so at the time I, I, I didn't know what it was. I mean, he's like, ah, your back's messed up. I'm like, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. what, what I did is I took a, I took a chunk of shrapnel about the size of a 50 cent piece. And, uh, when, when the, the projectile hit the back right of the hum V, what I think happened is we all went flying forward. So instead of this, you know, 50 cent piece of chunk of metal going right through my scapula on my right side, going through my lung, just enough where it was kind of a glancing blow where it entered my back, traveled up into my shoulder and stayed lodged in my shoulder. But I basically have a scar about this big on my back. And then it, it dug all the way through the muscle and stuff all the way up into my delt at that time, I didn't know there was even a chunk of shrapnel in there until like oh two days gosh. later. Um, they just thought you're I find someone you're probably in shock at the time and just didn't feel hardly anything. I reckon. Well, yeah. And what it did actually is, you know, the back looked really bad. I lost a lot of blood, but the piece of metal cauterized itself all the way up into my shoulder. Oh, okay. So I wasn't losing any blood up in my shoulder or anything just from the wound, the entrance wound. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, so, so we, we, we hold up in the, hold up in this culvert and then all of a sudden, like it's getting close to sun up and all of a sudden we, some vehicles start approaching and we're like, oh, we are definitely screwed now. You know, like there's no <laughs> way, there is no way that we're defending this one, you know? So, right. so we're like, M9 out, like, this is going to be, this is going <laughs> to go bad, you know? And, and, you know, it, it's Ranger QRF, but they had no way of getting a hold of us because I, I don't know why, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. No, you know, no, no one called us to say they were en route or no one passed through the aircraft to pass to us that they were en route until uh-huh. they got there. And then it was like, okay. You're like, thank God it's them. Yeah. Cause they launched a QRF from, from the airfield. Once they had it secure, they then yeah, launched yeah. a platoon down there. They brought us up to the, uh, up to that airfield or right outside the airfield. And, uh, and I remember I get, get, get there and, uh, there's Josh, the PJ and there's 
John, um, uh, John, who's like, you know, yep. on a yep. Skedco. And then there's, right. uh, someone in a body bag, you know, that's kind of oh, when we man. learned the fate of, uh, of the, the rest, rest of our team. And at that point, you know, now they're pump, they're pumping like morphine, morphine into us and, you know, everything possible. And, and I remember, uh, they're like, Hey, we have, uh, we have medevac coming in to get you. Um, and I remember they, they put us on these, on in, in like a convoy of like seven vehicles. We drive out to the inner, you know, like two lane hardball road out in the middle of, yeah, of yeah. the desert right there. And, uh, I only got with Mark Hurst, you know, it's the first time I've seen <laughs> everyone from the 17th and it was like, I was so happy to see him. I was, was going like, to say, I was going to say, like, man, you know, we're awesome. both. <laughs> I think we're like, we're like both tech sergeants, you know, and like, you know, kind of all of us, you know, you and I and him, we all kind of joined the same time. We've known him for a long yeah. time. It was just like, that was, it was like awesome. It was like refreshing to see, see him. And, you know, you kind of like felt yeah. secure at that point. And, um, for sure, for sure. They bring in, a, a you know, uh, an airplane that's from one of the other specialized units. It's a fixed wing aircraft. Right. It comes and lands right on the highway, loads nice. us up, and uh, and we do like a three hour low level jinking and jiving through the daylight because all the not all but a lot of the surf to air threats are still active, and they sure. got to fly us to Kuwait City. So we fly from Tikrit all the way through Iraq, all the way down, skirting Baghdad, all the way down. Wow! And uh, we're just like you know, it's like you know, it's like a low level but like even more aggressive. Yeah. And, um, and plus you're and, injured. So like you're it already, yeah. You know, so it sucks being a hundred percent, you know, let alone being laid up, you know? So, so the, the, on the only thing I remember about that flight is like, I'm like, it's a three hour flight to Kuwait city. And they're like, well, we're not going straight line distance because we have to go around <laughs> stuff and we're jinking and jiving. And this is the first time I'm getting like some detailed medicals. They had a medic on the bird and everything. And I'm like, I remember I'm on my hands and knees and I got my hands up against the side of the airplane and this doc is just jamming gauze up my back. Oh. You just, 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 just stuffing the whole wound, you know, like it's going all the way up from yeah, the middle yeah. of my back up into my shoulder. And I remember <laughs> he's has this gauze in his hand and the airplane does a jink and he falls backwards. He like yanks it all out of my back. Like you start oh. a lawnmower. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, I'm like dude, like probably would have hurt worse. Oh I wasn't like high and stuff, but I was like, I don't know. That's, that's kind of like my main memory of that. And, oh. and, I mean, and, I'm uh, sure did it, was it like excruciating or were you still kind of out no, of it? No, it was like, just, I felt it. I felt it, but I probably crazy. shouldn't have felt it because, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. So, yeah. So we land in, uh, they fly us right into Kuwait city and there's a, there's basically a mash hospital, medical, medical tent, surgical hospital. And, you know, we land yeah, yeah. and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, we're getting assessment. I got this big, I got this big bump on my shoulder and they're like, they're like, uh, yeah, you probably broke your clavicle. And I'm like, I don't know. I can kind of move my shit around. Yeah. And yeah. then they, they take me into x-ray, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm fully in DCUs, bloody, you know, everything, every other cutting stuff off. And, and, uh, and they're like, oh yeah, you got some, some metal up there. So we're going to send you into surgery. So I remember having surgery in Kuwait city to basically remove the shrapnel, clean up the back. And then we're there for like 24, 12, like 18 hours. And then our team gets split into two. Half of us go to launch stool and half of us go to road to Spain. Okay. Uh, I think John, like the more serious wounded ones, they went up to, um, up to launch stool. Whereas mm -hmm. Rhoda was again a, it was a a tent hospital type thing, you know. Okay. So yeah, so so we we get well, that, in, I mean, we get in. I guess that made you feel a little bit better because I mean you it, okay, you don't need to go to the big hospital. You're at least they've stabilized you enough where you're probably not. I don't I don't know this up, till af afterwards. Oh, that's you know, a good point. I just yeah, know, you like, know hey, that. we're we're medevacing you guys. You guys, you three are going to Rhoda. And we're like, where's the other dudes? Oh, they left earlier. They are they're already on their way to launch duel. You know, like, okay. Wow. And uh and I get and then we spend like maybe three or four days in Rhoda. And then uh then we we medevac 
medevac back to Walt Reed. And then we're on like the, I think it was still flying. I think they were still flying 141s back then. I don't, I think the medevac birds were still 141s, not C-17s. Okay. And uh, yeah, we're flying, we're flying back to, back to launch or to, to Walt Reed. And like, um, everyone on this bird are all, are all folks that are like, Oh, so-and-so has an appendicitis. So-and-so, you know, they're all, they're all folks that are like stationed at like PSAB and bases like that. There's no, like any other like combat wounded folks other than like the three of us on this bird. Everyone else is like, you know, Hey, I get to go home because, you know, I twisted my knee and I have to have knee surgery because I was working at Al or something like that, you know? <laughs> so we were like the first ones, like, coming back in through the medical system for the for yeah, yeah. you know because it was early on i mean baghdad yeah had i mean it fell yeah yeah i watched yeah, i watched because the, there wouldn't be anybody else yeah i watched all of the um yeah so we're at walter reed for like five days five six days for go back to fort benning and and, and we're at walter reed and uh we wa- we're watching fox news and we're like yeah you know tanks enter Baghdad, Baghdad fell, you know, and I were in home for like a week. And they're like, I remember like, we're sitting there watching TV like, ah, oh, first Americans enter the city of Tikrit, Saddam's birthplace. And we're like, uh, we were there like 14 days ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was my shortest deployment. I think that one ended up being like 21 days, <laughs> including the prep to go into theater or to go across the border, you know? Jeez. But, <laughs> Yeah, so that's my fun Iraq story. It was pretty man, it was cool up crazy. until then, you know. Yeah, you guys were getting after it, um, man. But just you having the wherewithal to go back and get that GPS from the trucks, pretty much, kind of probably saved the guys that went to launch tool. Those dudes, he probably saved their life because if they were that laid up, where they needed to be directly medevac back to Germany, you know, had they been had you not had that GPS and and couldn't tell anybody where you were you know it could have been a lot worse i think don't you think yeah i mean yeah i like to think that you know it was it was a benefit added and helped the team out and helped everyone (laughs) yeah for sure i mean it did i mean having the radio i mean i mean mean, um, no for sure the radio yeah yeah, radio with the gps i mean that you i yeah that was having the wherewithal to do that after getting blown up was just amazing man that's awesome like uh you know like I'm I'm just glad it was nighttime because you know I was we were under nods so I actually had my Mitch helmet on so I took a right, chunk right. of shrapnel about half an inch up from the from the bottom of the helmet that just it split the helmet right there it used to be in the used to be in the display case in the at the heritage room at the 17th I don't know if it's there oh anymore. really yeah, yeah so I, I took know. a chunk of shrapnel right in the back of my neck back of my head right there which you know would, I would have not be talking to you right now had I not had my you know, oh yeah, ballistic helmet on. You know, which had it been daytime, I probably would have been rolling with a ball cap and wouldn't be talking to you right now. So, man, that's a good point. Yeah, Please. we get Please. we get back to yeah. Fort Benning, and uh, and I have to go like a month of. I have to leave these wounds open. They haven't closed them yet. They're packed because it has to start healing from the inside out, right? So, like every oh, day, yeah. I had to have the gauze packed and removed oh, every day. Geez. So like, did you have to go to the doc to get that done or no, could somebody else do it? You know, my mom came down or whoever was there. And, and, you know, I would, I would, you know, I was, I was living on Percocet for like six weeks. I mean, I was straight up addicted. I know, I I know I was, (laughs) but I loved it, you Uh, know, cause it, it did, it does more for me than morphine. Right. So I would, I'd be like, all right, it's 7 PM. I need to take like four of these right now. So that in 30 minutes we can do this thing and and get, get past it. Oh my God. uh, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. So then after about, uh, after about a month of that, I go in to have the skin graft. They you know, take a chunk of skin off my thigh and, and put it in the back. And then they sew this big ball of gauze, it's like the size of a softball. They basically sew it to your back to, to make sure that there's pressure on it, holding the skin in place. Okay. The, you know, so right now, like if you look at my back, it looks like someone took like a, took a nine iron and put a divot in the middle of my right scapula. You know, uh, it's a little concave right there, but, um, yeah, yeah. so that was, you know, so from start to finish, it's about, it's about six to eight weeks and I was back jumping. Hey!